I think we should start. Uh, so first, I apologize uh, my absence uh, last Thursday due to my son and uh, illness. Uh, but hopefully uh, that won't you that won't that will prevent you from like uh, uh, immersing in too much content as you have uh, more time to do the homework. So uh, uh, maybe you have noticed that we have released our uh, homework too today, and the deal will be uh, in two weeks. So I'm 14 days to work on that. So um, again, uh, I mean, uh, although I have mentioned like 1,000 times, but I want to emphasize again, like, uh, this course is uh, known to be challenging, part, partly because the course load is pretty heavy. Uh, I emphasize a lot. Right? So uh, please uh, uh, do me a favor to start to do your homework as early as possible. We have uh, allocated plenty of office hours to help, I believe, right? But uh, from my uh, experience and also feedback from our TMs and TA, uh, we actually uh, didn't see uh, too many students to, to come in. I have, I have, uh, I have discussed uh, with a few students who come in. Uh, they, 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 they give very good questions. I think I enjoy discussing with them. But uh, mostly my office hour is just empty. And then, like, Five hours before deadline, and then I receive a few requests to ask for extension. Well, I just kind of uh, I cannot do that, right? Because just a few requests, and also uh, also you cannot ask for extension like three hours before deadline. It's not that doesn't, that doesn't make sense, right? So <clears throat> again, um, uh, please start to do the homework uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I don't think that homework is really, really difficult as long as you uh, seriously take the home, uh, take the lecture, uh, watch the video, and follow the instructor. I don't think there, 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 there's a big deal with that. But the issue is that you have to do both the, uh, the paper problems and the programming assignments. Especially for those programming assignments, uh, I, I can hardly believe that you can, you can write down your code in one hour and without any debugging. It works on a real data set. Uh, that, uh, that's from my point of view, I cannot understand. If, if you can do that, wow, you're, you're super, you're super man, you're super man. That's, that's good, right? If you cannot do that, please, uh, please uh, start to do it uh, earlier. And again, uh, come to the office hour, and uh, we have four hours on Friday. So with our two camps, uh, one uh, manage two hours in the morning, one manage uh, the other two hours uh, in the afternoon. So uh, 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 please take uh, take full advantage of uh, our efforts to help you. Does that make sense? Uh huh. How many more assignments are there? How many what? How many more assignments? Uh, we have six assignments in total. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, right? So um, if you finish the homework two, then we'll, we'll have all only oh how about that? Five, three, right? Okay. Any other question? In the homework or in the assignment description, it asks you to um, for your output to be similar to your report. Like for your program to print out similar results to your report. So I guess my question is to what extent do you want us to do you want us to print out um, kind of a, a print statement corresponding to every single. It's not that. It's them. not. It's not that reverse. As long as we run, when we run uh, your, uh, your your program, um, the output ma matches uh, what you report. But it doesn't mean like you, it must be exactly the same as like uh, three decimal or four decimals. That's not. It's not that crazy. Um, but to be consistent, I uh, I strongly suggest you guys to um, fix the C random C, especially when you implement your uh, random forest, so that when we rerun our result, we uh, when your learned trees uh, are totally are are kind of similar to what your report is good, right? It is totally different. We 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 actually do not know whether it is because the report is different. Is wrong, or it's just because the different random seats. 
I guess what I'm asking is, should we assume that the TAs are not even going to look at our code? And no, we'll look at your code. Okay, so. But we, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, pass your code. We we'll just look at structure of code. So okay, this is a a, a a piece of code which makes sense. It's working normally as we expect. But we cannot. We won't check whether your information gain is correctly uh, coded. This is, this is not our job. But we, we should run it. We should make sure that your code is run. Mm -hmm. As far as the output is concerned, is it all right if we uh, write this stuff to a file and then just print out where the file is located? Yeah, it's good. If you can, if you want to do that, then that's good. We'll, we'll open your output file. Uh -huh. um, is it okay if instead of uh, like in the future, instead of maybe like doing like a diagram of your tree, just to have like a print tree function that will print out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, any any readable information is acceptable. We do not request require you to 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 the form, uh, format your your output to be very clear or whatever. But if it just if, it, if your output does not make it, make any sense, then that's a problem. Any other question? Okay, great. And the second thing, uh, uh, we have released the uh, uh, invitation link for the Kaggle competition. So, uh, you, so you have, if you have a, a notify our TMs that you uh, decide to do the um, Kaggle competition, so feel free to try to do that. I would set maximum uh, submissions per day is 10. So you, have, you can try uh, 10 submissions to improve your scores and such that you can um, try to be ranked in top. We have extra credits for extra bonus on, 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 on top 10 ranked uh, students. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, any other question regarding the project? Again, regarding the project as well, uh, the same, the same, uh, the same uh, suggestion. Right? Um, uh, if you are having to figure out uh, what kind of project you want to do, and you're, if you are not sure about that, feel free to uh, come to the office hour for a discussion. I guess uh, regarding the uh, competition, um, or at least for the assignment that's posted on Canvas. So, um, what exactly are we supposed to submit for that? Because there's the Google document with all of every with everyone. You're signing up their name, their UID, and their username. Mm -hmm. um, what are we supposed to be submitting on Canvas, if anything? Submit on Canvas. You mean a For you the, mean a pro project? Yeah, the project due on February fifteenth. Oh, uh, you need to submit. Uh, I guess it should be one page, right? It should be one page description about your. Uh, if you are doing cattle computation, you need to you need to notify your name and your comment and uh, uh, what else? Uh, I have the difficult one. Yeah, it should be our project proposal, right? So, uh, yeah, for the uh, for the competitive project, you need to register for the Kaggle competition and make dummy submission. And also, you should submit your Kaggle user details on camera so that we can check your identity in competition. Uh, if we, uh, our team chose to give you the Google document, right? So that means you do not need to make an uh, explicit submission on that. As long as you feel, as long as that form, Contains all those information. 
Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other question regarding the project? Yeah. I, I, for for any for uh, anyone else who wants to do the exploratory project, please start to think about what you are uh, what you are um, gonna do, right? And uh, what kind of topic you want to do, and uh, how do you form a team? Okay. So. Uh, Yeah, let us uh, continue with our uh, linear models. So uh, in the last lecture, uh, we uh, briefly introduced uh, uh, the idea of linear models. Namely, we uh, uh, model the uh, output in the label space as kind of linear function of the uh, input variables in the input space, right? So uh, it sounds uh, very simple and straightforward, uh, but we discussed um, what's the potential advantage, right? So for example, on this uh, training set, if we want to perfectly separate all the positive examples from negative examples, by positive example I mean those uh, uh, red triangles, negative examples means uh, uh, blue circles, right? So of course we need a more vivid curve, a kind of such kind of curve we can um, perfectly separate every positive example from every negative example. And if, but if we use a, a linear model, so this line as a distinct boundary obviously cannot perfectly separate these two types of the uh, instances, right? But what is the benefit for using a straight line to do the separation rather than this very curve? Mm -hmm. Better for noise? Yes. We mentioned that, right? So although this curve looks really flexible, right? But this curve is very easy uh, is very easily influenced by some noises. Right? So consider some kind of consider this data set that actually contains some noises. So for example, this uh, a red triangle, the its label is original blue circle, right? It's just corrected by some noises. Then that 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 causes this big curvature here, right? And also, uh, for example, here uh, this blue circle was supposed to be this uh, triangle. But it was corrected, so it looks like this, right? And then, if we still use this curve to perfect fit every data, including the noisy uh, examples, the consequence is that next time, uh, if I have uh, uh, two test examples here and here, right? So we say, obviously, this curve will make wrong predictions. But if we use uh, a line, a linear model to do the classification, Things becomes different, right? So although it's, it looks like it doesn't perfectly fit to the training data, but it's much more robust to to the noises uh, surrounding on uh, the boundaries, right? So uh, that's one uh, intuitive example to illustrate the uh, benefit of linear classifiers in uh, classification case, and I also discussed the regression case, right? So the regression means that we want to predict some real values uh, rather than give you a, give you a label, a discrete label, right? So suppose this is our training set. We have input x and x axis and output value y and y axis, right? So for this set of training uh, data, how, how do we train a model to fit it? Obviously, we can use a flexible curve to pass through every training example. That means our training error is simply zero, right? If we use a, a line, namely a linear regression, to Predict to make the uh, to, to regress every input. Obviously, our training error won't be uh, zero. But what's the benefit? Again, this line is more immune to uh, the uh, potential noises, right? So you can say, suppose this 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 one here, right? Why uh, why the curvature why, why the curve has uh, such a high curvature here? It's probably that this point our origin not here. They're just corrupted by some noises, so it is stretched over here. And similarly, this point uh, was originally here, but it was uh, put put up here, right? So if those are those curves, the curvature here are caused by some potential noises, so, and we still use this curve to fit every data point, then we'll be in trouble in the future case when we make predictions, right? Say we have an example here, so we know, okay, 
the uh, actual, the true value should be here, right? But if we train our model to fit noises, then our training error is quite large. Right? But if we use uh, a line, we use a linear model, the training error is, uh, is much, much smaller. Right? So now uh, let us give a, a, a more formal definition of linear classifiers. Right? We, we should look at how to define linear classifiers, what kind of parameters do we need, and what kind of rules do we use to uh, give you the labels. Right? So uh, first, uh, in general, we assume our input is an n-dimensional vector. Right? And our output is a binary label. And for convenience, we choose the label be either minus one or positive one. So in many real world applications, you will say, okay, the label is zero or one. Uh, be aware of this subtle difference. Because when we choose this, uh, some, some computation, some uh, derivation will be a little simpler. And if you choose zero and one, and then it's better for you to first multiply y subtract, and then subtract it by one. So you convert it into minus one one. Does it make sense? Okay, so linear classifiers are also called uh, linear threshold units. So this comes from the uh, neural network uh, literature. So this jargon comes from the neural network literature. So basically, the real linear classifier is some kind of neural, but basically they are the same. Okay, so it classifies an example x using two parameters. One parameter is a weak vector W. A second parameter is a scalar B, which is real, right, which is continuous. And then according uh, according to the following classification rule, they gives a label. So namely, the output is a sign of this inner product between a weak vector and input vector plus the scalar B. Okay? And uh, this inner product can be further written as you know, the summation over the product of each individual elements of W and X. That means if this W transpose X plus B is not negative, then we predict, we predict Y to be one, positive label, right? Otherwise, we predict the label to be minus one, negative label. And B is also called bus term. So someone may ask why I should choose, uh, I should put the equality uh, on, on the positive prediction case, right? So there's no, I mean, strict standard for that. I just use the, I mean, commonly, the common customer would just put, or just uh, 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 define that if this classification function is non active at zero, then we predict positive label. You can put, it, put it equality here, merge it into uh, the case that the classification function less than zero is fine. But in our class, we just we just stick to this uh, uh, custom, okay? So a linear classifier also has a very nice geometry uh, interpretation. So um, I encourage you guys to uh, keep this in mind because we will uh, continue, uh, we will repeatedly use geometry interpretation to explain uh, the following uh, linear, class, uh, linear classifier learning algorithms, uh, including the well-known support vector machines. Actually, in support vector machines, you will see the geometry of linear classifier can give you a lot of uh, 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 in-depth understanding and, and intuition. Right? So let, let us start with like uh, plane, right? x, y plane. I suppose these are our training examples, positive examples, negative examples. So we have our uh, linear classifier here. So our prediction will be uh, the sign of this uh, classification function. Right? Because our features are just two-dimensional, so the weak vector consists of two elements, w1, w2, and in the product, x1, x2, right? And plus b, right? So uh, visually, we can represent this uh, classification function uh, classification rule as a line. This line represents the classification boundary. This line is, 
this line actually represents, uh, is determined by this equality, namely the classification function here inside the parenthesis is simply zero. Why is this reasonable? We need to recall what we have learned in geometry or in high school or in first years undergrad school, right? So because this line separates the whole plane into two two parts, right? So all the parts, all the points on this side have this uh, classification function bigger than zero, right? And for the remaining points, I mean the points which stay in the second half part, this classification function in the left hand side is less than zero, right? Uh, why don't we use uh, x1 or x2 uh, for only this line for classification? Because they are separate uh, positive and negative very precise. Why, why don't you what? Use why what? don't we use x1, only x1, not the combination of x1 and x2 for, uh, uh, for separate the positive and negative? Why don't you use uh, epsilon? Not x1. x1. Yeah. Oh. We're talking about the general representation. Like, you, you mean, okay, I just use this one. It's one, one axis, right? Mm -hmm. So you can view it as a, a special case of our linear classifier where W2 is simply zero, right? So we're simply, we're talking about the general case. Like, you can imagine, like, if I just uh, rotate the samples here and here, um, so we must have some inclined line to separate the both parts of points. Right? Mm -hmm. In this case, x1 and x2, those are different features, right? Yeah, different features. So the input space are two-dimensional space here, x, y space, right? So x1, x2 are different features. And now I want to ask if, for this line, if we want to represent the vector which perpendicular to this line, what is that vector? Yes. Right. So this is just a, some basic knowledge. If you cannot recall it right now, it's, it's fine. I cannot recall it when I first uh, learned the linear classifier as well. Mm -hmm. What is that in here? Sorry. So I, I just asked if I want to find out a vector which is orthogonal to this line, what's that vector? Can I read that vector directly from this uh, equation? So the answer is simply w1, w2. So this vector, this vector is represented by w1, w2, namely the weak vector. So as to why, this is a, the, the proof is, is really straightforward. So you can just pick up two points here and here, right? And then you subtract it down, you get the line, which is parallel to this classification boundary, right? You, can, you will show that this line must be orthogonal to this because their inner product is zero. Right, so uh, I leave it as a practice for you to recall what you have learned maybe a long time ago, right? So another thing we should be uh, aware is that for a classification case, we actually only care about the sign. We do not care about the magnitude. In other words, if we skew B, W1, W2 by the same constant, now zero constant, uh, the classification result won't change. And also the position of this line won't change as well. So it doesn't matter if you multiply all of three parameters by 100, 1 billion, or 0 0.1, 0 0.001. As long as it's a positive and non zero, uh, they are equivalent. Uh, we can compute W1 and W2. How do we compute W1 and W2? That's a good question. This is essentially the learning procedure, right? So suppose I I give you this set of training examples. How, that, how can you identify a set of best values for W1, W2, and B? Right? This is actually the training problem. That's what we're going to discuss uh, after we briefly introduce all the properties of linear passwords. We actually have about 
a bunch of different algorithms to identify W and B. Okay? So, so we can easily extend this geometry into like n dimensional space, right? So in n dimensional space, so let us first think of, uh, imagine about three dimensional space. So in the three dimensional space, what is the uh, classical boundary? Plane. A plane, a surface, right? Then this, you know that in the three dimensional space, b plus w1, x1, w2, x2, w3, x3 will be a, a plane, right? Will be a surface. And uh, in the n dimensional space, uh, this classical boundary is called a uh, uh, hyperplane. Anyway, it's kind of plane. It's a hyperplane because it's a more than three dimensional. And then this hyperplane will always separate the whole space into uh, two subspaces. We call this uh, two subspaces as uh, half spaces. And so when you make those kind of jargon, uh, don't worry. It just means you separate the line, the, the, the space into two parts. And sometimes um, we'll, we'll feel like tedious to always write down uh, the bus term and the weight back, right? So for convenience, uh, uh, we can stop writing this bus term by using some notational sugar. How can we do that? We can augment our input vector by inserting a constant feature 1 so that we get an augmented feature by x prime, right? Denoted by x prime. And meanwhile, we can fold the bias term B uh, into our weight vector W. So we get an augmented weight vector denoted by W prime, right? And then our classification function can be written as uh, uh, a sole inner product between W prime and X prime, right? And our rule will be like, just take the sum of this inner product. So they're totally the same, right? totally the same. Uh, we just uh, we just uh, combine combine W and B together. So uh, sometimes we'll fold the bus term into the input by adding actual constant feature. But remember, do remember uh, there is such a bus term here. Don't 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 uh, don't be uh, don't be confused. So any question regarding this? Sorry, what exactly does it mean to, to fold when you uh, rewrite x as uh, 1 and x prime is here to set, expand, like uh, change the dimension of x? Yes. Actually, if the original uh, feature vector is n dimensional, right? So if you add one constant feature, it will be n plus 1 dimensional. Right? But but this is just for convenience, because I don't I do not want to explicitly write down the bus term. I want my uh, I want I want my notation to be simple. Any other question? Okay, so here are uh, a few uh, linear classifier learning algorithms we're going to discuss. Uh -huh. uh, the uh, W prime uh, X prime is simplified now. We don't we don't have V, but for uh, calculating W prime, you need B uh, and W. Okay, so actually you need B. You have to know what how we No, it, it depends. It depends on how uh, you design your training hours. So, in some in some kind of training hours, like least mean square method, we're going to discuss probably today or tomorrow. Um, it actually is it's better to fold them into that because you the computation, the way to compute or update B is the same as uh, the way to update W. So, so it's even better to fold them. But this is. It's just for when you derive something, when you represent something on paper, uh, it's convenient to do that. But that does not necessarily mean that in the computation, you treat it in the same way. Okay. So here are a set of uh, uh, algorithms, uh, linear classifier learning algorithms that we're going to discuss uh, throughout the semester. Right? So the first problem is the simplest. Uh, Probably the simplest linear classifier is called reception. Uh, you see that it's an error-driven learning procedure. So it will update the hypothesis, namely the linear classifier, only if uh, I made a mistake in predicting the current training example. So sometimes it's also called online uh, linear classifier. 
And then uh, we'll spend quite a lot of time uh, in discussing these uh, support back machines, um, uh, which by far the most popular machine learning algorithm used. Uh, the most popular machine learning algorithm is not deep neural nets. Uh, don't be don't be misled by the hypes. So actually, uh, when you have some machine learning computations, uh, the first uh, choice will be support back machines or decision trees. It's simpler algorithms. And support back machines is working very well in many, many applications. So usually people use that as a baseline. If it works well, we're done. And also, support back machines can give you, uh, 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 it, it makes a beautiful connection between the computational learning theory and uh, the actual machine learning problem. It's something that, that directly very elegant and also in practice working very well. So that's uh, that's why I require everybody at us to be familiar with the power machines. Okay, and then um, we'll introduce two holistic uh, version of of linear models. One is called naive based Hasper. A second is called logistic regression. So those two classifiers uh, uh, are also widely used. Naive based classifiers are very widely used in spam filtering, uh, spam email detection. So uh, it is simple. It is a simple linear classifier with a probabilistic interpretation. So you see that we can explain the linear classifier as a probabilistic uh, uh, sampling procedure. So how we sample each feature and given this feature, how we sample the uh, <coughs> and for for logistic regression uh, is actually belongs to a so-called discriminative classifier. So the output of logistic regression will be some probability. So logistic regression is very widely used in recommendation, online advertising. So in many, uh, like when you when you, when you log in on Amazon or eBay, or whatever, when when they recommend you some silly products, uh, it might be done by some logistic regression. And another task, I mean. In addition to classification, will be the regression, right? So, uh, correspondingly, linear models for regression is called linear regression. So this is about predicting real value outputs. And linear classifier is about predicting discrete class label, right? So, that, that, that essentially, there are differences only like how you define line, how you define the label space. For linear regression, the label space consists of continuous values. And for linear classification, the label space are, are discrete. Right? It only contains a finite number of the uh, 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 a finite number of labels. So those are the uh, brief introduction and definition regarding uh, linear models. So the next, we're going to discuss uh, the expressive of uh, linear classifiers. So it looks like linear models are simple, right? But how simple? Is it? What kind of uh, functions do linear classifier express? Right? What kind of functions uh, linear classifiers cannot express? How does it compare with uh, decision trees? And then the next topic will be this square method for regression. We we'll start with linear regression because we're only need to look at one learning algorithm for regression, and then we'll go through several uh, classical. Uh, linear classifier learning algorithms. Okay, so uh, first let us look at how expressive uh, will a linear classifier be. Right? So uh, to simplify the uh, discussion, we only consider Bloom functions. So what are Bloom functions? Bloom functions just means okay, the function, the output of the function is just binary, and also each input of your function is binary as well. This is called Bloom functions. So among to construct rule functions, we have many logic logical operations like conjunction and disjunctions, right? So uh, we'll use this uh, uh, rule function as an example to illustrate uh, the expressiveness of the uh, of the uh, linear classifiers. Right? So so first, uh, linear classifiers uh, can be considered as an expressive hypothesis class. That means okay, uh, it's quite expressive. Um, Many Bloom functions are linearly separable, meaning that for any for many Bloom functions, we can find out an equivalent 
linear classifier, which gives you the uh, exact same prediction as the original bloom function. But it does not cover all possible kind of functions. It means that there are always some blue functions that cannot be perfectly represented by linear classifier. But how about decision trees? We mentioned that decision trees can represent any blue function, right? Why? We discussed this point before, right? Why why decision trees can is able to represent all blue functions? We call the learning algorithm. What's the what's the learning procedure of decision trees? The ID3 algorithm? Depths and how uh, the tree you can have two to the n uh, output. So this is the exact number of um, uh, how we set up the same data. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So that's that's kind of a more in depth analysis, but I just want, but I just from my point of view, I I, I can give an even simpler view, right? So remember, ID three algorithm. When the ID, here I mean, you can you can expand, you can freely expand the same trees. We do not restrict the size of the tree, right? You just like your tree to grow as much as possible, right? So in that kind of case, when the decision tree stop growing and create new nodes, or create leaf nodes. Are you the same label or there's no more questions to ask? Yes. Only when all the instances have the same label stop, right? So that means okay, no matter what your bloom functions can partition your data set into many parts, right? So the decision tree is, is gonna reach this purely labeled subsets and give them a sum of the, the same label. That's it. So so the uh, the learning algorithm, the nature of learning algorithm for decision trees, uh, has already determined that the tree can represent any blue functions. But for linear classifiers, we'll see that a few counterexamples that linear classifier cannot can never be able to uh, perfectly represent them. That means that linear classifiers actually are not as expressive as uh, expressive as uh, decision trees. So, uh, if you re uh, if you if you can uh, recall uh, some examples of uh, cross section boundary for decision trees, uh, if you still recall, right, we have actually shown some nonlinear cross section boundary for decision trees in our previous lectures. So from that you can sense that that you can you can sense that decision tree actually is more complex than linear classifiers. Okay, so uh, let us uh, look at first uh, example. Right? So uh, the conjunctions. So what is conjunctions? Conjunctions are just the conjunction of several of the variables. Right? Conjunction means oh, uh, they must uh, they must uh, they must all be true to have uh, the output to be true, right? To have the conjunction to be true. So take an example. So suppose this balloon function has three variables: x1, x2, x3. Remember, all three variables are binary, right? A conjunction of x1, x2, x3 means that only when all the three variables are one, the true truth, then the conjunction is true, right? So now I want to ask, how do we construct and include a linear classifier? An idea? If you perchance um lump all x1, x2, and x3 together and kind of make them into one since um, you either have they're all true or some of them are false and those are your two categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the right idea. Um, can I give more, someone, anyone give more details? Uh -huh. You can use for example x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus 3 equal to 0. Then yes. yes, yes, exactly right. 
So let me repeat. So we know that uh, according to the I'm sorry, I need to change the I need to change the, the, the marker. The, it's the right all right of boundary. So according to the definition, right? The uh, conjunction is uh, true. If and only if uh, all the three variables are true, right? Remember, x1, x, x2, x3 are binary variables. That means their summation must be at least three, right? In other words, we can uh, we can equivalently uh, represent it as uh, y equals to one if and only if x1 plus x2 plus x3 is no less than three, right? So if uh, any of the three variables is zero, this inequality won't hold, and then y will be zero, right? And from this, we can just uh, uh, move the right-hand side to the left-hand side. We can construct our classification function, right? Which is x1 plus x2 plus x3 subtracted by 3. We can take a look at the sign of our classification function. See, all the negative values indicate that zero. Zero output, right? So only one zero values uh, indicate uh, uh, the output to be true, right? to be true, which is one. So now we 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 have uh, obtained our equivalent linear classifier for this conjunction. So now that I want to ask, let's just to reinforce your uh, the definition of the uh, of the, the linear class. So what what are the weight vectors? I heard that. One, 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 right? So what is the bus prime here? Minus three, right? So keep it in mind, like when you construct a linear classifier, you must have a weight vector and a bus prime here. So now uh, let's let's make a little change on this conjunction. I, I want to incorporate some negation, right? What what about the conjunction of x one, x two, and uh, negation of x three? Can we construct an equivalent linear classifier? An idea? Since you can change the uh, sign of x3 to minus. Yes. Okay. Negation means 1 minus x3, right? So if I replace negation of x3 by 1 minus x3, then the remaining thing is the same, right? So we use 1 minus x in a linear threshold unit if x is negated, then y equals to the conjunction of x1, x2, and the negation of x3 is equivalent to say y is 1 if and only if x1 plus x2 plus 1 minus x3 is no less than 3, right? So we can now turn this inequality into a linear classifier. So now the question is, what is the weight vector? What is bias prime? Three, one, one, and then one minus one. Yep. And the other B is two. B is two. Are you yeah. sure? Minus. Yeah, minus two. Right? Be careful about some. Right? <laughs> so if you do a little bit uh, arrangement, right, and merge the terms, you get well, x one plus x two minus x three is no less than two. You move two to the left hand side, you get. 1, 1, minus 1 as the weight, weight vector, and minus 2 as the bias prime. So now let us do the exercise. Right? So if what if I change the conjunction to be disjunction? So if I my blue function is, is a disjunction of x1, x2, and x3, can we Construct an equivalent linear classifier. This function means x1 or x2 or x3. Do we have a, an equivalent linear classifier to represent the disjunction? No idea? Uh, okay. X1 plus x2 plus x3 uh, greater or equal than 1. 
Yes, right? So this is the definition of disjunction, right? So uh, as long as there's one variable which is true, then the disjunction is true, right? So that means there's summation uh, as long as it's, no, uh, it's bigger than zero. That means it's bigger than or equal to one. That's fine, right? And then we'll follow the same thing to construct a linear classifier. And also we're free to uh, negate any variables in the disjunction, right? Any question? Uh -huh. For example, we can use uh, Mr. Fu uh, 1.5. So we have a lot of linear classes. Yeah, 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 definitely. Which of them is better or there is no difference? Um, for this particular move function, I mean, the, the representation power is the same. Yeah, but if we put it in a more complicated case, it's like x1, x2, x3, or continuous, this become different. But here we'll just give you some toy examples to show uh, the connection between linear classifiers and some move functions. Does it make sense? OK. So uh, another particular uh, type of uh, uh, move functions which can be uh, represented by linear classifier is called M of n rules. So uh, what is M of n rules? So basically, uh, our Bloom function consists of n Bloom variables. Right? So the output is true if and only if at least n of them are true. So all the other variables are ignored. But we do not specify which set of m variables must be true. Any, any set of m variables are true, then the output will be true. This is called m of n rules. So to see a concrete example, suppose we have uh, like three Bloom variables, x1, x2, and x3, right? So I want to construct two of three rules, meaning that at least the two of uh, x1, x2, x3 are true, then this two of three rule is true. The question is that, can we make a linear classifier which is equivalent to this two of three rule. Yes, it's simple, straightforward, right? You just uh, you just uh, write out this. Uh, you just convert the definition of M of n rules into some linear gain equality, right? So x one plus x three plus three uh, plus x uh, x one plus x two plus x three is no less than two. Um, then I just move up. Uh, to, to the left hand side and construct my linear possible. So any, any question at this point? Okay. So now let us look at some uh, counterexample uh, in which we can now find an equivalent linear possible. So this is a famous uh, uh, famous example. Uh, if you're if the distribution or the location of your training examples have some parity, like positive examples are staying here and negative examples are staying here, then they are never be able to classify by some, I mean perfectly classify by some linear classifier. You can try to draw some line across the whole plane. You'll find you'll never be able to find a line to separate all the positive examples from all the negative examples. So what is the specific uh, uh, blue function that acts with parity and, and uh, fails to be classified by linear classifiers? Uh, this function is called x wall. So everybody knows x wall, right? So when x wall is true? Either both are true or both are false. Yes. x wall. yeah. So, how can we see the parity in XOR function? If we say XOR of X, X1, X2 is true, that means the number of 1 is given. In that case, you will never, never be able to find a classifier, linear classifier, to separate 
to, 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 to give an exact, exact prediction of XORSA value. And in addition to XOR, there are many other non trivial Bloom functions which are nonlinear and cannot be classified by cannot, cannot be classified by some linear classifiers. This is one another example. So why would we uh, why should we pay attention to XOR? Right? So I want to share with you some gossip. So it's not gossip, it's, it's some history. So uh, uh, Maybe 90, 1960s, right? So when the perception algorithm was developed, uh, people are uh, people were really excited and thought that uh, the AI has some hope, right? So they're gonna implement AI in 10 years, and then a lot of research and funding are coming to this direction. And until um, after 10 years, uh, the uh, pioneer, another pioneer in artificial intelligence, his name is Marvin, Marvin Minsky, he wrote a book. And criticize perception because perception is essentially a linear classifier. He said that the linear classifier has a limited uh, expressiveness. For example, X4 cannot be classified linear classifiers. And then the whole direction was cool. And then uh, jumps into the winter, and uh, a lot of uh, researchers are left this direction, no funding, no grants. So this is a famous function. But right now, we have already got a method. Even for those parity functions, we can still find a way to construct linear classifier to well separate the positive example and negative examples. So this is called a feature transformation or nonlinear feature mapping. So this is, this is, a, this is actually a, a kind of basic trick right now. So uh, before we construct linear classifiers, we usually apply some nonlinear feature transformation trick to transform the original feature representation into a new feature space, such that in a new space, all those input examples can be linearly separated. So, how, how, so, so, so now let us look at how can we do this, right? So uh, suppose we're looking at this set example, right? So this is just in one dimensional space. We can see. The positive examples are in the middle of the negative examples, right? In this one-dimensional space, in this one-dimensional space, you will never be able to find a line to separate all the positive examples from negative examples. It won't. That won't be possible. How can I address this problem? We still want to use some linear classifier to to do the job. How can we do that, right? So the idea is that I'm not going to construct my linear classifier in one-dimensional space. We know that it's impossible. Instead, I'm going to augment the feature representation for each point. So the original feature, or the original uh, data points, each data point is represented by one scalar, right? the one dimensional space. And now I augment another feature, which is x squared. So now you see, each data point is now represented by a two dimensional feature vector, x and x squared. And now let us look at what happened. If I augment the feature representation. So in the two-dimensional space, the locations, here are the locations of the examples. Now I'll ask, can we find a line to separate positive examples from negative examples? This is very it's very obvious, right? So we can find a line to, to do this job. So now I see the idea here, right? So in our little feature space. Maybe we should draw very complicated boundaries or curve to separate positive examples from negative examples, right? We do not want to do that. We want more robust, simpler linear classifier. What should we do, right? We need to do uh, some process over the feature representations. I'm going to use some smart method to augment some features, to map the original features into some high dimensional space, higher dimensional space. We expect that in a higher dimensional space, those Training examples or label examples have some uh, raw separated boundaries. That's the idea. In one dimension, uh, linear classifiers are just points, yes? Yeah. 
uh, why in uh, one dimension you want to be linear, but for your life, line will curve. As I mentioned, I want, why, why do we want a linear classifier? Because it's simple, it's robust analysis, right? So I still want a linear classifier. But the problem is that in the original feature space, I cannot find it. Of course, you can instead draw a line like this. Uh, not draw a line, draw a curve, right? But you're going to two-dimensional two at that point. Yeah, I'm going to two-dimensional space. So what's, what's your concern? I mean, uh, in one dimension, we just uh, are looking for uh, one point to separate the data, not a line. No, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, yeah, one point. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can yeah, you can see this on one point. Yeah, how separate with our one dimension go down this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that that, that does matter, right? So if in a one-dimensional space, that's a point, right? If two-dimensional space is a plane, and a three-dimensional space is a hyperplane, right? So the key is that how do we find out a hyperplane, a surface, a line to separate those data points in terms of some, in terms of some feature representations? So as to why should we stick on to the linear classifiers? We mentioned that intuitively there are more robust analysis, right? So actually, there is some kind of uh, uh, computational learning theory guarantee on that. S uh, smaller sample complexity and uh, uh, better generalization performance, which will we'll, which will discuss in more detail uh, when we talk about the uh, support vector machines. But as for now, let, 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 let's just build about intuition. Right? We choose to use. Linear transfer because it is more robust. And this trick in general is called kernel tree. So through through a kernel tree, actually we can convert many nonlinear classification or nonlinear regression problem into a linear structure. Mm -hmm. So this is this is prone to overfitting because it seems like you could like do like an arbitrary many there's like arbitrary with many uh, transformations you could make. Uh, and isn't that sort of like at some point when you'd be overfitting it? Um that's a good point, but this is uh, not directly combined. Is is not directly binding to uh overfitting. Overfitting means that okay, you can find out some kind of uh, classifier perfect to fit the train data, right? But here we just do some transformation on train data. We do not have more information on that. Well, can you, I mean, for any given set of data, can you find some transformation that's arbitrarily complex to like cleanly partition the data? No, it's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed that for any data you can you can you can find out some kind of transformation that be a perfect fit by any uh, on the any labels. So that relates to a concept called. Uh, uh, or the VC dimension. We mean, uh, we'll, we'll discuss it later. I mean, well, I mean, like in like the simple case, you could just make like a piecewise function, like for every point of data, like if it's like uh, like positive, you map it to like one, and if it's negative, you map it to negative one, and then that's that's true. You can separate that. In that uh, in that transformation, actually, you utilize label information. It's not feature transformation. So you imagine that if you do that, now I'll give you a test example. You do not know the label. How do you do the transformation? Well, then it's, it's overfitting. It's not overfitting because you do the transformation means I do the pre-process of the data. Right? You do the pre-process data. That means you do not know the label. Of course, I can use my training label to do such kind of uh, transformation following a method. Uh, well, I can perfectly fit the training data. But the issue is that I cannot use this uh, model to to predict the future example because in the future example, I don't know, it. I don't know the label. Without label, I cannot conduct with, with, with the feature transformation. But here, I mean, I mean, if you want to do the feature transformation, you cannot utilize label information. If you utilize label information, then 
uh, is not this is not necessary to do like I can I can even I can even like uh, transform the the, the the examples in in one dimensional space. We we'll still do that, right? But anyway, in general, this trip is called kernel trip. I will see that how do we utilize some kernel function to map the original feature repetitions into features in even infinite dimensional feature space. In that space, we can find some linear classifier on that. And of course, in that space, we cannot explicitly write some weak vector because weak vector is infinite dimensional as well. But we have some like beautiful and complex structure to represent um, those type those type of models. Does it make sense? Yeah. I mean, regarding the feature transformation issues, I'm not talking about like the kernel trick just now. That's the that's our topic. How do we find the uh, transformation function like in this case x squared? That's a good question. Actually, in general, you don't have like the, you don't have some rule to do the transformation. Actually, the feature transformation in practice uh, are usually done by some kernel function. It's not done by some actually. And what do you mean by kernel function? That's some topic we'll discuss in future. Okay. Any other question? Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, we put the uh, zero points at exactly uh, in between the data points. Mm -hmm. uh, what if, it, uh, what if um, it was on the side of uh, our data points? So the uh, diagram would be like this, not like the uh, symmetry shapes. Oh, you mean I put it at, as x to the power of 3 or just x? No, to the power of 2, but the, uh, we decide here that the zero point is at the exact mm -hmm. the, between the points, at the at middle point. Yep. Here? Yep. We put the zero point of the diagram at the middle point. Oh, that's the that's the property of the data, right? If you move, you can move here and move move here. That won't change the result. If you move here, it is it will here. Right? Move here, will be here. I don't think that will change much about the Cartesian bound. Right? Uh, if you if you if you're curious about that, do we have any other feature transformation or representation to do this kind of things, and which can also have a Cartesian boundary? Um, I guess it's yes. Right. Here, this is just one example. This is not a unique transformation to give you a, a linear Cartesian boundary. Okay? This is just one idea. Hmm? Is the transformation there is the different dimensions? Uh, it's not necessary. But usually, if you want your transformation to be uh, effective, it uh, usually goes to higher dimensions. Okay, so now I leave an exercise for you. We know that actual function is not linear and separable. And then the, your task is to design some feature transformation such that after you map your XOR, the input of X more into some higher dimensional space, or even into the same dimension, as you mentioned, right? So you can find out a linear classifier which can give exact prediction as XOR function does. Okay, so uh, in practice, uh, even the data seems like seem, seems uh, most probably to be linearly separable due to some noises, uh, due to some uh, errors. Uh, we cannot find a perfect line to separate every positive examples from negative examples. In such kind of cases, uh, we call the data sets called. Uh, as almost uh, linear separable. So see, this positive, this bunch of bunch of positive examples, this bunch of negative examples, right? So we believe that we use this line can bear, uh, bear, uh, can separate the data set very well, right? But obviously, I cannot find line to 100% actually separate all the, all data points. Right? I have a like one two misclassified examples. One is here, one is here. They're surrounding, they're surrounding on the uh, classic boundary thing. So in this case, if we 
Then, okay, I'm, I'm okay with uh, being a classifier. I'm think, I still <coughs> think this data is linear separable because all is linear separable. But someone asked, what is the standard of almost linear separable? Um, the answer is that it depends how much noise um, do you allow. For some, like picky guys, maybe it's not linear separable. Right? But it depends on the application. For some particular application, I think, okay, only 5% of examples are, are if, if only 5% of examples are mis, mis separated, it's okay. I can still call this data linearly separable. That's almost linearly separable. Right? But some applications say, okay, it must, it must be 1%, less than 1% examples. Um, that can be mis separated. Okay? Any questions so far? So, to summarize, I mean, uh, what is what, what are our general impression about linear classifiers? So first, many functions are linear, uh, so they are expressive. Second, linear classifiers are often good guess for hypothesis space. So uh, in practice, we will try to address some machine learning tasks. Uh, you might have, uh, it's probably that you have no idea about what kind of target function it should be. It might be some highly complicated, highly nonlinear, uh, or it might be simple linear or much linear. So uh, in those kind of situations, we can start to use linear classifiers and see whether the performance is okay. If the performance is good, it satisfies our requirement, and then we're done. Otherwise, we can switch to a more complicated nonlinear classifiers or nonlinear models. And also, be aware, um, there are some functions that are not linear and uh, cannot be directly classified by some linear uh, models, like XOR function and a few non-trivial Bloom functions. You will see them in the homework too. So, but we have some methods to make them linear in higher dimensional feature space. So, uh, by some smart feature transformations. And this trick will, will, will mention it uh, repeatedly until we talk about uh, the general kernel trick. So briefly, kernel, kernel trick is to borrow some powers, specific type of functions or kernel function. You can do the evaluation of kernel function is equivalent to first do some feature transmission and do the inner product. So we will, anyway, we'll talk about later. Any question? Huh? So um, my dad looking at the graphical versions of it, uh -huh. uh, it's the, when you do something like x squared to, um, to uh, this part? Yeah, to put it into like a higher dimensional space. Um, how do we graphically look at something like x or or Trinity? Uh, if uh, if well, x or is only about like two variables. Uh, I think it's still possible. Yeah, yeah. If you if you just add append one more feature while you're looking everything in the three dimensional space, it's possible. But if it's four dimensional or five dimensional space, it won't be possible. Yeah. But it does not mean that you construct this nonlinear feature mapping by only looking at the geometry view. Actually, you can look at the table. Um, it's it's doable. I'm pretty much sure about that. Any other question? Uh, to link uh, to the kernel function, uh, do you have access access to uh, the position of points on the line, for example, in this uh, case? No, you do not have. Actually, we should first do the feature transmission and then find the line. It's not no. it's not reverse. In a uh, previous slide. Uh huh. You mean this? Yes. We, we have access to the point of yeah of course position. this those those are training set right yeah. those there are set are, are there you can access them okay then um, we can always find the kernel function um, to transform data uh, to to the two dimension and then find the line like no no there's no guarantee on that 
Like for example, if uh, if we have access to the position of points, we can, for example, uh, make uh, positive ones one. Yeah, I think your question is the same as same I mentioned before. Again, when we do the feature transformation, you cannot utilize the label information. If you use label information, now I give you a test example. How do you do the test? You don't have the label for the test. You cannot finish the transformation. Anyway, I, I, I'm happy that it uh, looks like you guys are very interested in, in this trick. But we will spend, we'll spend quite a lot of time to talk about that. Um, OK. So I, I, I have a question. OK, so one last point uh, you should be aware, uh, very, uh, you should pay attention to. So why should we um, incorporate Webster in our linear processor? So this is our training points, right? Positive and negative points, right? So this is our classification boundary determined by both the weak factor and the bias parameter. So now I, I want to ask, uh, why should I, why can't I just throw out B? Yeah, that's kind of a good point. Any other supplement? Well, just building off of that, right? W and X help form kind of the direction of, uh, or help form the two sides, then uh, the bias factor D helps determine exactly where to draw this line on the graph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent point. I, I was going to say that, like, you need, you need to define some sort of uh, like precision, right? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you guys gave a, a very good point, right? So now let us. Let us uh, uh, think about what if I do not have the bias term? What is the position? Huh? So I mean, without the bias term, like any sort of like uh, like hyperplane, whatever, is going to have to pass through the origin. Yes. But I can imagine like all the points are above the origin. There's no way that could. Yes, exactly. Really yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you think in that way, you can see how absurd that if I if I just kick out um, the, the, the 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 bias term, right? So if I have uh, the bias term to be zero, or in other words, I just throw out the bias term, then your hyperplane, your classification boundary will always pass through the origin, right? So the, 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 the consequence is that if I have a bunch of uh, uh, training examples surrounding this boundary, uh, surrounding this origin, uh, it is very tricky for me to find a, a good hyperplane, right? To separate a positive example and negative examples, right? So for, the, for, for this two set of uh, Two examples. Obviously, I can find a line here, right, to separate, to perfectly separate them. But now, if I set my, I, I throw out my bias term, then I can only rotate my line, which of course is uh, uh, the, which crosses the the the, 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 orange all the time, right? So you see, I cannot find a perfect line here. So in a nutshell, actually, the weight vector determines the direction, right, and the bias parameter determines the location. So you should combine both of them to, to, to give a comprehensive expressiveness of your, of your linear classifier. OK, any, any question regarding the definition of the uh, linear models and linear classifiers? OK, great. So, um, and then, um, Uh, uh, algorithms for different linear models, right? So we start with linear regression because we only look at one linear algorithm for linear regression. This is called least mean square method. So uh, we're going to introduce uh, some couple examples uh, for which we'll, we can apply linear regression. And then uh, to train a linear regression model or to learn a linear regression model, uh, we need to first construct an objective function. It's called least mean square objective function. So see that learning essentially is to optimize this objective function to find out the best weak vector and the bias parameter. Um, so what kind of optimization method do we usually choose? Uh, we will introduce the gradient set. Probably uh, many of you are quite familiar with that. If so, we just do a quick review. And then we're going to introduce a, a even more widely used approach. It's called stochastic gradient set. So, uh, this is very quick, 
and uh, uh, very profit for large scale business. Okay. So uh, let us uh, uh, look at a concrete application for the question. Right? So the problem is that um, suppose uh, I have a car's weight and age, how do I predict the mileage? If we convert it into a, a, a machine learning problem that I have collected, it will be that I have collected a set of cars, data from a set of cars, right? For each car, I have the weight and the year. I have uh, the weight from mileage. Right? Now, I want to uh, learn a model which, when, when we give the weight and age of a car, we can predict the mileage. So the weight and age can be considered as two features, x1, x2. I want to build a model. I want to build a model to predict the mileage. So here we can use uh, the linear regression model. Means that we uh, predict the mileage as a, a, a linear function of the uh, x1, x2. So in the linear regression model, we have to introduce uh, the weight vector w1, w2, and also bus parameter w0, right? So here. For convenience, we just put, we just uh, fold them into our weight vector. So we have w zero, w one, w two. Okay. And the learning procedure is essentially to use the training data to find the best possible value of the weight vector w. Right? So here we put w zero, w one, w two into one vector denoted by this uh, weight vector. And then. Given the values of x1, x2 for a new car, I can use this learned w to predict mileage for this new car. So this is setting up our problem. Any question? OK, so let us continue the discussion on Thursday. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so like the